everyone. My name is Jessica Stewart. I'm the Associate Director of Social Science Matrix, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our book discussion today on Rosemary Joyce's The Future of Nuclear Waste, What Art and Archaeology is About the Securing the World's Most Hazardous Material. For those of you new to Matrix, we are a cross-disciplinary social science institute. Today's event is part of our Authors Meets Critics series which features critically engaged dis discussions about recently published books by faculty in UC Berkeley's social science division. For each event, the author discusses key, the key arguments of their book with fellow scholars who share research interests from other disciplines. If you haven't already, um, we encourage you to sign up for our newsletters and to check out our events page. We have some very exciting events in development for the spring term, including panels devoted to Steve Weber's Block by Block how to build a global enterprise for the new regional order. And uh, Steve has appointments in poli sci and in the School of Information. And um, then we'll also have an event around Jovan Scott Lewis's Scammer's Yard, Crime of Black Repair in Jamaica. And uh, jo Mr. Professor Lewis is in geography. And then we'll also um, have another event on, based on Armando Laura um, Milan's Redistributing the Poor, Jails, Hospitals, and the Crisis of Law and Fiscal Austerity. Um, I'll look for those all coming up in the spring. I also wanna take a moment to mention another series of programs, um, which we call Matrix on Point. So these are panel discussions on urgent matters of the moment. Later this month, we'll consider the rise of democratically elected authoritarians around the world, and in December, we'll have a panel on the economic impacts of COVID-19, as well as a discussion on immigration. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce both the authors and critics of today's event. Rosemary Joyce is professor in the anthropology department. Her publications include books and articles on the use of representational imagery to create and reinforce gendered identities, ranging from examinations of classic Maya monumental art and glyphic texts to formative, period, monumental, and small-scale images. As a museum anthropologist, Professor Joyce, is, uh, Professor Joyce works with curated collections, including photographs and historical archives in museums in North America, Europe, and Honduras. Kate O'Neill is a professor in the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management. She's written three books, um, Waste Trading Among Rich Nations, Building a New Theory of Environmental Regulation, MIT 2000, The Environment and International Relations, Cambridge University Press 2009, and Waste, Polity Press 2019. She has worked on collaborative projects on new and innovative methods for studying global environmental policies and governance, where problems are complex, multi-scalar, and unpredictable. Catherine Carson is professor and Thomas M. Sabell presidential chair in the history of science. A historian and ethnographer of contemporary science and technology, she is known for her biography of Werner Herzberg, uh, Heisenberg, Heisenberg in the Atomic Age, Science and the Public Sphere. Before getting her PhD in history, Professor Carson was trained in computational condensed ma matter physics. Her current historical research engages with Heidegger and science, including theoretical physics and concepts of um, conceptions of data, and on risk and simulation in nuclear waste management. Um, so before I turn over to Professor Joyce, I'll just uh, say a quick word about the format so you can all anticipate the, the flow of the event. Um, the author will open offer, offering summarizing commentary about the central arguments of the book for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then the interlocutors, otherwise known as the critics, will follow, each discussing the work according to their own scholarly vantage point for about 10 to 15 minutes. After the critics present, the author will have the opportunity to offer a response and um, initiate a conversation between the panelists. In the last 10 to 15 minutes, you'll see me reappear. And at that time, I can pose um, to the panel any questions that have been submitted via the Q&A feature, um, and then the, the panelists can respond. So without further ado, um, please let me turn it over to Professor Joyce for the opening presentation. Um, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the Social Science Matrix for the invitation to engage in my um, interlocutors, I hope, rather than critics, uh, for taking the time to read the book and to uh, bring their own particular interests to bear. 
and all of those who are actually attending in person now or anybody who might join the streaming. Um, before beginning, I want to acknowledge that we're speaking from the unceded territory of the Wichon Ohlone people, um, where Berkeley uh, University is located and where many of us are physically located. Um, and to acknowledge the important contributions that the Ohlone have made to the history of anthropology in specific at Berkeley. Uh, I want to do a few things with the very generous time that the center has given me to talk about the book. And the, the first of these is to give some sense of why I wrote the book, where it comes from. Um, on the face of it, it may seem surprising to those of you who are not archaeologists to have an archaeologist writing a book about, apparently, about uh, the um, handling of nuclear waste. And so I want to talk a little bit about the genesis of the book. Um, and I want to talk about what's at stake, uh, stakes that were not always apparent to me at the beginning, but emerged as I was writing the book. Um, because I don't assume that all of you have uh, had the time to read the book, although I hope many of you will, I'm going to also try and talk a little bit about the core, the central um, structure of the book and the central story it tells. Uh, and then um, I want to end with some of the things that I discovered in writing the book or things that I didn't set out to, uh, to uh, expose or to talk about, but that the book itself led me to. So as an archeologist, my field work has been as in the country of Honduras in Central America. And the archeological sites that I have worked at on range and date from the earliest villages before 1600 BC, um, all the way through to the 20th century. Uh, that kind of scope of work has led me to actually ask questions about long-term temporalities, about how ongoing understandings of futures by people in the past could be conceived by those of us who are in their future and for whom what happened is now a past. So that sort of inter intertwining of futurity, of the way people think about futures, which is, uh, from my perspective, an, an actual challenge for archaeologists. It's way too easy for an archaeologist to engage in a kind of a teleological explanation where you explain the origins of things by what they became. Uh, the specific things that I set out to try and think about in the long term were monuments the archaeological sites that I work on that are the earliest villages in Central America are also the sites of the first monumental constructions, the first building of earthen platforms that could be called pyramids. So those villages from around 1600 BC, after about 600 years of people dwelling in them and residing, we see the first intentions to create what become pyramids of up to 25 meters tall, up to 100 meters on a side. And so one of the questions that I've been exploring for a long time in my research is how people actually would could conceive of an unprecedented project of that scale and scope, um, how they could come to do something as a building project in a uh, agricultural village without centralized leadership that requires the coordination of a great deal of effort by a large number of people to create a novel mark on the landscape. So I've, I've been interested in monument making and in how we think about monuments and how we think about the future thinking that's involved in creating them. But more prosaically, less, less, uh, less of a, sort of a broader research theme, this book actually began with teaching. And I think that's important at a public university to stress the fact that teaching isn't just a process by which we transmit already formed knowledge to students. In 1999, in the run up to what the uh, year 2000, two colleague, colleagues and I taught in a course, an interdisciplinary course in the Letters and Sciences Discovery Program on time, on thinking about time, on temporalities. And as part of putting together the materials for that course, I was looking for uh, evocative 
uh, kinds of citations of long-term thinking that we could bring into the discussion, not just the archeological cases that we were prepared for. And while reading Time Magazine, I saw a brief note about what Time Magazine characterized somewhat um, inaccurately as a government effort to have artists propose plans to mark nuclear waste sites so that they would not be violated for 10,000 years. And that was precisely the kind of long-term thinking that I was interested in. And it was intriguing to see the juxtaposition of a government planning process and calling on artists, especially the way that time characterized it, that the artists were drawing on universal features that would repel people, such as the use of sharp pointed metal of red and of jaggedness. And immediately as an anthropologist, I was attracted to the idea of universals, the sort of way that Time Magazine imputed onto this planning exercise, a shared understanding, a common sense about how people always react to certain materials, colors, textures, uh, because as an anthropologist, that goes against one of our sort of central understandings, which is that there's very little that can be assumed to be universal. So on the one hand, I had a uh, immediate impetus to look into this uh, work for the course. And on the other hand, it, it fed into my trying to think of a way to talk about the unprecedented projects that people in Honduras undertook between 1000 and 700 BC. It's a long time since 1999. This book is 20 years in the making. It was 20 years in the making for a lot of different reasons. One of them is that as I worked in the first couple of years with uh, government information, I found that there was a much richer and more complex story than the, the single item in Time Magazine uh, brought me to. And I began to read what ultimately are thousands of pages of government reports, commentaries by other government agencies on those reports, public responses to them, and realized that there was a, a much thicker, much deeper story that required longer time. Unfortunately for me, in the middle of this, um, the events of September 9th, uh, 11th of 2001 took place, and that led to the relocation of the government documents I had been using. Uh, ultimately, many of them reappeared in other places, not all of them. Um, I haven't been able to find everything that I had originally come up with. And um, that uh, actually slowed the process down in a way that I think ultimately proves to be very productive because it gave me time to begin to actually read more about both of the strands of the planning exercise involved. I want to talk a little bit about the strands of the planning exercise. The book itself ends up having two narratives told alternately in a series of chapters and a series of interludes between the chapters. In the chapters, I comment on one government planning exercise or one team of this exercise and its realization of a plan based on archaeology that if implemented, I argue, would be the construction of a, of a uh, manufactured archaeological ruin, an archaeological ruin configured in such a way, as members of the project said, that it would be immediately a cultural heritage monument. So we're looking at with what's called Marker's Team B, with a reliance on archaeology to come up with design features that the team asserted would allow people in the future to anticipate that the place where nuclear waste was buried was important and in fact dangerous in more and less specific ways. Experts team A, on the other hand, was the uh, source of the plan that Time Magazine uh, characterized as a plan by artists. And here uh, we see instead of a reliance purely on archaeological warrants, a projection of universal archetypes that does lead to designs that look more like artworks 
and specifically like modern artworks. Landscape scale installations uh, that were intended to create a sense of disaster, to cause visitors to feel a sense of unease. Uh, as I look through the specifications for Team A's design, which comes from um, basically environmental and landscape architects, I was led to think about the projects that were actually taking place in the same landscape that was proposed for these nuclear waste repositories and therefore for their markers, the, the US uh, West, which has for a, a long time, co coinciding with the development of these plans, been treated as a kind of canvas for landscape scale art installations by modern artists, by artists called land or earth artists. And at first, when I began to think through um, the government marker exercise as a kind of, on the one hand, construction of archaeological sites, and on the other hand, construction of a form of land art, it seemed like uh, um, an arbitrary juxtaposition. It was, it was my decision that land art would be a way for me to tack back and forth, to use the statements of modern land artists who talk about what their intentions are, who talk about what they think will happen over the long term with these large scale markers that they put together. That juxtaposition came from my interest in having additional ways of thinking about the long term. And then as I continued, I discovered that in fact, the markers exercise included a proposal not incorporated in the final plan to commission a work of land art as part of the visualizing a sense of disaster. So the book tacks back and forth between these two different kinds of planning in order to explore the logics in both of them. In uh, the archetype based approach, uh, the planners talk at some length about the kind of um, expectations they have of humans reacting similarly to particular places in the physical environment. And they try to design a kind of overly dense, unpleasant city life. So one of their plans is, is a grid of blocks of stone painted black that would be hot in the desert sun. Um, they talk about possibly putting together uh, a landscape of spikes rising up from the earth that are intended to represent the negation of what they say are archetypes of, um, of ordering of quote, intransigent nature. They talk about the fact that none of their designs use quote, any of the regular or ideal geometric forms, only crude craftsmanship is sought because they say the geometry of ideal forms is a fundamental human invention, a seeking of perfection in an imperfect world. So in the very words of the planning exercise, you can see the same kind of speculation that we find in artist statements that accompany many of the land art projects that I compare to. Uh, team A, one scientist on Team A ends though by dissenting and saying, if the collective proposals are carried out, the site will quickly become known as one of the major architectural and artistic marvels of the modern world. And that pivot, the idea of these markers being something that will become a place of distinction on a landscape that can't repel intrusion, leads us to the alternative project of Markers Team B, um, the one of uh, the team that drew on archaeology as its model. And Markers Team B repeatedly uses the phrase, the test of time, to say that what it's seeking is to base its design on historical analogs of structures, media, and messages that have withstood the test of time. And in the book, I try to disarticulate the two different kinds of tests of time there. On the one hand, the idea that materials endure for long periods of time because humans designed them to endure for long periods of time signified repeatedly in the book by the citation of Stonehenge, as if that 
modern cultural heritage monument was built in its distant past by people who were thinking of us thousands of years in their future, rather than as we now know from the ongoing and extremely exciting work of the Stonehenge archeological project, being a landscape that was constructed for use within the generations of the people who inhabited it and not with this kind of long-term futurity. So on the one hand, we have the idea of, of materials themselves withstanding the test of time. And there repeatedly, the, the planning exercise concludes that we can do better than any past society because materials can now be controlled much better than at any time in the past. And one of the things I think is very interesting as an archeologist is that over and over the actual um, materials push back. The design is based on positing use of granite markers slabs and yet quarrying uh, quarry owners and operators who are asked by different government agencies if they can make things to the specifications say that uh, cutting granite slabs that large without them fracturing is actually not feasible with current technology. Um, and this in turn, and I talk about granite at length in the first chapter of the book, exposes the fact that the way that we think about materials is not automatically based on their actual properties. It's based on cultural histories of our engagements with materials. And so I talk about how granite comes in, especially in a specific uh, North American US context, comes to be figured as an especially durable material when in fact, Granite is not inherently a durable material, but is um, inherently a material that has uh, micro fractures that can be um, can be uh, support an ecology of micro organisms, and whose exploitation as a building material by humans was actually based on that very fact: the ability to break it up with stone tools. The second form of withstanding the test of time that I talk about in the book is the one that I, I'm going to not give much attention to in this presentation, which is the idea that messages can be conveyed for long periods of time with uh, a relative degree of lack of ambiguity. In part, I'm not talking about it as much because there have been other studies by other scholars that I think go into this in quite, um, quite sufficient detail. And in part because, uh, it's a bizarre and, and wonderful story of its own that um, would require more than the time that we have. Um, I hope I do some justice to the kind of thinking about long-term conveyance of messages, which includes a kind of utopian belief in the ability to create a messaging language which removes ambiguity that's related to the 20th century creation or attempt to create unambiguous human languages. But ultimately, um, my interest in the book is about these marks on the landscape. And where the book led me was to ask the question, what's actually at stake? From the very earliest moments when I presented the project, one of the challenges I received over and over again was, what difference in the world would this intervention make? And my first attempt to answer that was to push back and say, well, I'm really writing this book in order to understand archeology, span in order to understand why what I know as an archeologist is not patently obvious to the people making this plan, which is if you design this thing, it's not going to be left alone. That's just not a thing humans do. Humans will continue to engage with material in the world. So why would you ever think you could do this? Um, luckily, the, the interdisciplinary groups that I've talked to over the years have pushed and pushed. And ultimately, I've come to understand that what's at stake here is something larger. And I want to talk, uh, end my presentation with the three things I think are at stake here. The first is understanding that humans are, are motivated by various forms of common senses. And here I'm using common sense, relying on an anthropological analysis by the anthropologist Michael Hertzfeld. Uh, what archeologists take for granted, what seems self-evident to me is a form of common sense. It's a expertise, sure, but that's the shared beliefs of my field. And there was another common sense that was being used by Team B when they talked about archeological sites, which I ultimately was able to identify as overlapping with the common sense of cult modern cultural heritage 
uh, designation and management, a common sense in which these large scale marks on the landscape were interpreted as intentional monument making. And there's a slippage between the word marker and monument in the project that I think betrays when we're moving between those forms of common sense. Um, and then there are other forms of common senses. And the common sense of artists is particularly one that I wanted to engage with. In the end, this interest in thinking about the various forms of common sense led me to Native American and Indigenous Studies scholars um, who I was reading for other reasons, partly motivated by my wonderful graduate students at Berkeley. And to realize that also what is at stake here is an understanding of the landscape as empty, which is a form of common sense, of the West in particular as empty and open to claim in a way that also I explore in the book in a chapter on the use of Australian Aboriginal art as a warrant in the book. And finally, um, the book, writing the book led me to realize that all of my attempts to explain the book tended to have recourse to poetry, to art, to fiction. And that this is part of what I think is a broader challenge for those of us in the social sciences whose work actually is sometimes not having the impact that it should have in the general world on people. Um, we have very refined and well-developed prosaics, our professional languages, but our ability to translate that so that someone who wouldn't normally read an archaeology book might actually read this whole book. That's where I think we need to uh, remind ourselves of the ability of a poetic language to convey the impact, the meaning, and the implications of things. And I'm going to stop there. I think I'm on time and uh, turn it over to So at this point, thank you so much, Rosemary, for that brilliant, stretching introduction to your book, which is one of the favorite things I've read this year. And so now we're going to move into the section where Kate and I offer reflections as colleagues, as interlocutors, and we've agreed that Kate will speak first. I will try to listen to both what Rosemary and Kate say and then bring it back to Rosemary for an ensuing discussion. So with that, I pass it to Kate. All right, yes, thank you, Rosemary. And thank you, Jessica, for asking me to comment. Um, I've got my, my partner in crime, Twinkle, next to me. I think she's settled down, so we'll, we'll see. Um, yeah, I, I think my comments will be uh, sort of as, as was asked from, from our own perspectives. And, I think we were talking a little bit yesterday uh, in preparation for today about how Rosemary did not want to write a book about nuclear waste. And here you have someone who's worked extensively on nuclear waste and other kinds of waste sitting here talking about it. So I think my presentation is both um, some questions for Rosemary, just, just kind of up there for discussion. And then sort of why, from my perspective, you should read this book. I think both Rosemary and, and Catherine have said quite eloquently that this is this is a book that speaks well beyond sort of an immediate anthropology, um, uh, uh, an immediate anthropology um, audience. So um, it's definitely a book that's interesting to those of us in the discard studies universe, where I live a good bit of the time, as well as um, probably some of the people I used to work on nuclear waste with. So I'll tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from and, and why I think this work is so important. Uh, back in the late, 2000, uh, late 90s, I was in fact doing a postdoc that was looking precisely at long-term options for nuclear waste storage. And so Yucca Mountain, um, the Goshut Band um, in Utah were all uh, very familiar as I was trying to get my, my head around what was going on with nuclear waste and something that we had never really managed to safely store a single gram of um, during the time uh, we were, we've, we've had to, to deal with it. And um, some of the other sort of international schemes, I know Sweden uh, had a plan to store its um, radioactive waste in a series of, of mines that had just happened to be located in one of their few indigenous 
um, community areas and had a competition for people to suggest what should be done with it that involved planting trees as prizes. And then of course the Australia case with Pangaea uh, broke when I was um, studying, doing this postdoc and that was a case where suddenly this international British based conglomerate suggested, let's put a whole bunch of nuclear waste in Australia, which is where I'm from. And without even, you know, and it was something that the government accepted as yes, we've got, empty land terra nullius out there, this would be great. This would be a great profit. Let's think about storage in the long term. Um, lesser known is the fact that Russia offered to do the same thing at about the same time. Uh, no conversation about long-term implications there. So you can probably guess there were possibly some profit making mot motives in that one. But anyway, so that's that's sort of really sort of understanding that, that even from the time that I was working on this and Rosemary started working on this, nuclear waste and what we do with it and how we think about it over the tens of thousands of years remains a really pressing and interesting problem, which I think is a, a really critical contribution of her book. Um, and also something I also said that anyone I know who studies nuclear waste or waste in general would be really interested in reading. So uh, she shouldn't worry about not having <laughs> our audience certainly uh, for, the, for the book or a very broad audience for the book. Um, also, just as a, a, an aside, when I, soon after I got here, I got here in 1999 and I worked with a, a nuclear group that was, studies group that was actually, I think, set up by Jean Rockland, late professor from Energy and Resources Group. And one of the people, the postdoc who ran it wound up, I think, in DOE, Department of Energy, and called me up, and this must be 2000 or 2001, to gauge whether I'd be interested in being on a panel that was thinking about how to signal um, to many, many generations in the future what we're gonna do with nuclear waste. So I don't know if this is the same group or in addition to the group, but um, I, from, I did not get very far. They probably figured out I was only on H1B visa status pretty quickly or they went a different direction, but I have literally been fascinated by this question ever since. And it really has been something I've thought about a lot over the years. And, um, the third thing, well, third or four, just to say, because I think this speaks to the themes and why the book is so appealing. I study the technosphere and most recently my, my work on waste. Um, the technosphere is the material output of collective human enterprise since the industrial revolution. And when you start thinking about Stonehenge and the pyramids, I would extend that way, way, way back. And that has been one of these kind of wild estimates by, by uh, various, I think, social scientists in this case, that's 30 trillion tons of human infrastructure, some of it in use, some of it to trade us, some of it we can still see, and some of it is buried, and quite a bit of it is also in space. But that that is not something to be left in the desert, like a landfill or a a radioactive waste facility that is marked by, by a monument, it is, it is a reservoir for us. It is a place we go for resources. So that's a fundamental way of thinking too about, well, we've got the most hazardous waste, but it's also part of this entire collectivity of human enterprise that is out there and is potentially some of it more available than others for, for our use So as a resource. And I will also just say, finally, I love science fiction. So of course I read a lot of far future space opera. So again, thinking about this. And as Rosemary was talking about archeologists and, and thinking about the future, I suddenly started thinking about all the archeologists who are characters in science fiction novels and films. That's a big, very present. Of course, the only one I can obviously think about right now is Stargate. <laughs> Stargate SG-1 and the movie, which is all about the pyramids and archaeology. So anyway, there you go. So I think I think you're absolutely not out of place <laughs> thinking these ways. Um, so yeah, so some questions and themes, and uh, hopefully I'm, I'm not going to run over. I have a bad habit of doing that. Um, I was... I was just really interested in how we're thinking about how the present speaks to the future or how we or how the people in, in your, that you're writing about the task forces think about this because it seems such a modern question as well. And if you're connecting it, how you were connecting this to thinking about Stonehenge and you thinking about it made me really realize that, wow, um, you know, 
we've been really thinking about this and just really in the past few generations that we can talk to the future. And we understand, I think what you're saying that, well, what can we do that would possibly be a marker 10,000 years hence would communicate? And I was just, are we really just trying to think about, hey, you know, uh, we were here. Is that what, why we're thinking along these ways, not necessarily just to say, this is dangerous, but to say, hey, we did something, we were here in um, anticipation of um, a very different set of, of um, civilizations in the future. And I was curious too, and just thinking about why this is, especially around nuclear waste, um, because nuclear waste is so significant because it is part of that array in the atomic nuclear world of weapons and technologies that can destroy us. Um, there are other waste detritus that are pretty much not, maybe not as long lasting, but very toxic and like mercury, for instance, which is also becoming more and more a figure of popular imagination as we kind of deal with it on a global level and other persistent organic pollutants. So there seems to be something really symbolic about nuclear waste that I think also heightens this discussion and heightens um, the attention being given to it at these very high levels of government, which, which actually leads me on, this might be a question that Rosemary can, can answer, which is who started these groups? I mean, you don't normally associate setting up a couple of task forces with archeologists and artists to think about the far future with the Department of Energy. I mean, that's just not really an automatic association. So I was wondering where this, this push for imagination and, and thinking way into the future came from, what the connections were, how suddenly these, these, these task forces were set up, because I think that's so interesting. Um, I also think that too, on the flip side, and this is especially true in your last chapters, thinking, well, how imaginative was it in the, in the long run? I mean, sort of some talk about some limits of vision in the way that how do I say this thinking sort of some some mo some models why I encourage people to read this is looking at some models of future civilizations that they were thinking about that were really quite retrogressive in some ways or regressive you know like all these all these feminists who uh, uh, a society of, of feminists who therefore um, resist technology in favor of feelings I think that's kind of right which was an actual sort of scenario that um, that there are many more interesting questions being um, put forward in the wider realms of science fiction that would be more um, applicable 10,000 years hence. And I can always think of many, many books that would go there, but it, it is that you've got this imagination, but at a certain point, this limits a vision that, that, that uh, in terms of what we're thinking about what is gonna be there 10,000 years hence. Anyway, so that's just, um, but my question was really about what was the origin and how did you get imagination at, at DOE? Um, and then I guess my final observation, I think I have a few minutes, right? Just almost there. Again, just goes back to my discard studies, trash and treasure, technosphere um, work. And I just, just really wanted to thank Rosemary for really allowing me to think about how monuments that we think of as kind of permanent sort of do change as they travel through time in terms of what they mean to the people around them, how they're used, how they're um, understood, how they're interpreted by different civilizations, um, generations moving through, um, are they monuments, are they relics, are they archeological treasures? Um, are they there for target practice or for graffiti? I mean, the, the whole thinking about how line drawings and so on have been modified over time. Well, a lot of that is ancient graffiti, I believe. <laughs> and that's sort of that, that notion that while we, 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 these things are living to us, we just don't necessarily notice that. And by, even by removing the graffiti, you're sort of removing something that's really important from history as well, like the evil, the evolution of this this monument. We're going back to this old idea of like wilderness being wilderness and never having been used, so we have to turn it back to to wilderness. So so we we have it. So that I think speaks very well to to um, to this notion of the technosphere, where you have this reservoir that's not just items of value that you can pull out and reuse and sell, although that is the case, but also um, the value through just 
how we differential value in terms of how we interpret the meaning of these um, monuments and so on through through history. And I think that speaks in, in sort of my field to really how a, something that you throw away or a waste or something you build just isn't so contingent, so contextually specific. And I think these are some really great examples of, of uh, why this is the case. And oh, I have a note here too about just how um, this translation over time means shows how humans take possession of these monuments over time. And why would that not happen to something being built for the future? And that that meaning, therefore, how would it last more than 200 years as people kind of took possession and did what they felt like and interpreted how they, they felt like it. Um, so again, you know, I, I believe that one should therefore expand this notion of the technosphere to include Stonehenge, the pyramids as far back as we can go. And I think that would be a really interesting way to kind of shake up how we think about uh, human detritus. And I just want to say how ironic as a final piece that in this cultural disposability of single use plastics that we're always talking about is to think about, well, there's a group of people wanting to build something that's going to last 10,000 years. Wow. You know, that is, that is sort of a, a very different way of thinking about um, manufacturing and building in a time where we're just so overwhelmed by the single use, the disposable, the immediate. In, in, in our daily lives. So anyway, I will stop there. Um, sorry about my ramblings, but I just, again, really fascinating. And I, I really encourage people to go out and read this, whether you're here or whether you're watching this later, um, I'm gonna encourage folks to, to get a copy too. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kate. That, that was wonderful to work with. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Of tempted to let Rosemary respond right away, but I've been told that we have a run of show that will follow. So I will try to do my best to play with things that both of you have said. Um, I think centering, let's say, on themes of fiction and narrative and of temporality. Um, as a nuclear historian and as someone who, like Kate, has been actually Kate and Rosemary, has been following nuclear waste developments for about 20 years. In fact, Kate and I crossed paths back in that working group that she mentioned back in the late 1990s, my goodness. Um, thinking about the ways in which temporality is at stake here, how timeframes are defined and imagined and managed seems a, a really fruitful way to bring out the connections to Rosemary's interests as a archaeologist and anthropologist. So we've been at nuclear waste management for 80 years now, more or less. I'm going to use this unmarked we for the moment, the we who have been doing nuclear things. We can go back to the laboratories in Gilman Hall here on campus, here on campus, um, that got radioactively contaminated while researchers were doing the world's earliest work on transuranic elements, the discovery of plutonium happened here at Berkeley in 1941. Even here at Berkeley on this multiply occupied territory, we've watched the history of nuclear waste play out in time. The sites on campus have been cleaned up and remediated, but the generation of nuclear waste has obviously continued and ramped up and expanded far beyond the 1940s Manhattan Project work in Gilman Hall. So the book that, that you've given us, Rosemary, looks at designs for something called WIP, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant outside of Carlsbad, New Mexico, and the proposed repository site at Yucca Mountain, Nevada. WIP is currently operating, just sort of setting some expectations for the audience as well, holds low level, transuranic waste contaminated with smaller amounts of plutonium like we had here at Berkeley. Yucca Mountain, by contrast, is being designed for what's called high-level waste with lots of fission products and other bad stuff. Mm -hmm. And both of these settings, WIP and Yucca Mountain in the imagined design, both have long time scales. And those time scales are determined by regulation. Right. Right. 
and thinking about what on earth it means to have the time scale of nuclear waste set by yes. decisions by the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, in particular, you've heard us speak about the 10,000 year time scale, which evokes archeological imaginings and was originally set by the EPA in 2001. Yeah. But what's behind that, if you imagine sort of the actions of materials that lead to 10,000 years, um, is the half-lives of radioactive de decay. And so if you're thinking like an expert in nuclear waste management, I hear using that unmarked you <laughs> again, mm -hmm. some radioactive isotopes, here, here's, like, here's how the techno-scientific way of thinking about it begins. It says like some radioactive isotopes have short half-lives. They decay fast, creating continuous bursts of heat and radiation, and they leave behind other radioactive or stable products. Some things have short half-lives, some things have medium half-lives, some products of nuclear fission take about 30 years for their radioactivity to fall by half. And some have very, very long half-lives of thousands of years, of tens of thousands of years, of hundreds of thousands of years, of millions of years. Yeah. So with that range of time scales, Nuclear waste is a metaphorical playground for people who like to play with time and who like to run models. Yeah. All of these different time scales just built into the radioactive material itself. You treat their assemblage, you as the nuclear waste modeler, mm -hmm. as an evolving, you could almost say, I'll sort of push on this and you can push back, Rosemary, almost an animate thing. No. Yes. Where, you know, like the dominating metaphor in here is decay but yet new lives are emerging out of that yeah. mess as others die. And it's individually totally unpredictable, yeah. but in aggregate, it follows this kind of natural law and gets labeled half-life. Yeah. So that's in the material itself. And that seems to me to resonate in some really interesting ways with things that both Kate and Rosemary have thought about. And then like layer on top of that, the different time scales in the geological environment for water flow, for engineered materials breaking down, for seismic activity, for climate change. And then layer on top of that, the time scales of human beings, farming and hunting and mining and intruding into things and building things. All of these both end up entangled in nuclear waste planning and also get treated as analytically distinct from each other, things that you can work with and model. So what, what does that modeling look like? How do, when you're inside the nuclear waste management world of technoscience, how do you work with those time scales? Yeah. Um, first of all, you, you sort of take the waste as given at a moment in time. You only ask about the past, how we got here. <laughs> yep. In so far as it affects what mix of materials, radiation and time scales you have to manage into the future. Like you don't do any story about how we came to moment T equals zero, except insofar as it tells you like, what's the different burden of different radioisotopes? You don't ask, why were we doing this? Um, you just take the mix as given. Right. And then you try to get a grip on these futures in terms of controlling them and containing them out to at least 10,000 years or to what's called the, the time of peak risk where peak risk means exposure to human beings mm -hmm. who are at the center of this story, peak risk. So American nuclear governance has created a set of regimes to handle this challenge. And this is a kind of you know, interesting backdrop and context for the beautiful piece of the story that you are unfolding for us, Rosemary. You know, the, the key tool that got people to think they could even imagine what to do with 10,000 years was that there are probabilistic risk assessment computational simulations where you okay. sort of feed in your idea of every possible event that could happen with a probabilistic life, likelihood and you simulate it in the computer out over time and you calculate out the changing balance of materials and radiation against the backdrop of all possible things that could go wrong and you yeah. look at the outcomes. So it, it's like this machinery for projecting things forward in time 
that starts from the material, which is the most manageable part of the situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Complicated, entangled, but follows a law. And then you compare that to the regulatory standard of human exposure. And you, you hope, if you're the nuclear yeah. waste modeler, that you come in below the regulatory line or you go back and try to develop new ways that make sure that you end up below the regulatory line that determines compliance out to the time frame that the EPA has set. Yeah. Um, I got fascinated by this because I wanted to write a history of this approach, an intellectual history of it. You know, it's just like cascading chains of disasters in nuclear power plants. It draws deeply from intellectual tools of imagining Cold War thermonuclear warfare. That's not my contribution, that's broadly known. Right. So for Rosemary's purpose, what's interesting is how it licenses thinking in time scales out to 10,000 years or beyond projecting what we know in the future using computer simulations, you know, increment the time bit by bit right. out to this unimaginably distant future by assuming that each step into the future is just like the present. And it's, it's a very, like, to, from a historian's point of view, and I'd imagine for where both of you come from dealing in human affairs, this is, this is an entirely different foreign and you might say incommensurable way of thinking about how to project time. You run a simulation with a tiny time increment and then human beings get, get fit into the scenarios. Right. Um, so like the, the, the feminist potash miners are part of, you know, they're, they're yet another piece in the massive scenario planning that is the basis of nuclear waste management. Um, and it, extends in other cases that are in your book into like imagining scenarios of a free state of Chihuahua governing the region or new religions and modes of conveyal of tradition and meaning through storytelling. Yeah. So most of the exercises that the US regulatory state did in the 1980s and 90s that Rosemary's book studied really centered on like imagining these futures before all of the full-fledged machinery of simulation had been out. Imagining them, sort of trying to put boundaries around them to contain them, but also to allow the scenarios to proliferate. Mm -hmm. And then to think about how we might communicate with them okay. about what we did and what we recommend they might do. And, and maybe Rosemary, if you want, if you have time, um, yeah. all of the complexities in that notion of yeah. communication. I mean, yeah. your book does such a beautiful job of exposing them and realizing yeah. that like information yeah. theory is also a product of the same Cold War era, 1920s yeah. control and command and thinking yeah. about, you know, like who, what is left out in the notion of conveying information. Your book does yeah. a lot of rich stuff with that. Yeah. So from my part, I guess, as I sort of move towards closing my remarks and opening it back up, I think it's fascinating for all of us to recognize how this temporal modeling of alternate futures works within the framework of a particular form of the US regulatory state. Yeah. Um, because what jumps out for me immediately reading it is the duration, right? Because mm -hmm. we might think that we have some kind of human grounded archeological intuitions, good or bad, about 10,000 mm -hmm. years as set by the EPA back in 2001. Mm -hmm. That was what the original risk assessment brought out as salient a 10,000 year period. That's what WIP is licensed under. Mm -hmm. What's being discussed now for regulation for Yucca Mountain, for high level waste like nuclear yes, reactor years. byproducts, it's, it's, it's out to a million years. A million years, yeah. A million years trying to get out to that period of maximal risk to human beings. If you, if you actually look at the curves of where the risks are, it's still growing after 10,000 years. It will go up by a factor of five or 10 by the time you get out to 100. Mm 
And when you go out to a million, you know, the simulations suggest that it stabilizes with current knowledge, which is meant to be reassuring. But our intuitions about a million years have to be grounded in an entirely different realm of conception. And to me, it feels very much more like storytelling and fiction in the service of an otherwise insoluble dilemma for the US regulatory state, which is that we've created the waste, we continue to create it. And we need to tell ourselves stories about how we are responsibly going to manage it when in the fact of the matter, there is no predicting control out to a million years in any human terms. So this is, I think, where we come back to some of the invitations that both of you have given us. How do we develop any understanding? How do we convey anything into a future that distant? Who does that kind of work for us? It is often science fiction. It is often narrative that is grounded in actively, actively recognized imagination and speculation rather than something that is um, best understood through academic scholarly processes of narrowing down uncertainties and defining ranges of possible outcomes. And so to me, it feels very much like this kind of performance of control and containment, almost like regulatory theater from the viewpoint of this like unmarked we of the present who set the terms <laughs> who are not everyone involved, who have a particular techno-scientific mindset, and then who think that our responsibility is to communicate our understanding into a future that is really just too vast. So one of the things I think in closing is to remark that, I mean, Rosemary, you, you've been saying actually for years now, there are several times in which we've had this discussion, how odd and problematic it is to think at these long time scales. Your book just beautifully opens our eyes to that question exactly through your, you would say common sense, I might say expertise as an archeologist. And I think that's an extraordinarily valuable contribution to this discussion. So with this, I think we anticipate very um, energetically and anxiously what Rosemary might share with us before we open it up to um, further conversations. And also there is definitely space if you're listening and want to put a question in the Q&A, please go ahead and do that so that our matrix hosts can bring that in as well. So Rosemary, I give it to you. Um, first of all, I want to thank you both for these incredibly generous and actually quite generative readings. I've been making notes and I feel like this, um, that there's another project and there are ways in which this speaks directly to the project I'm actually working on right now. Um, and I see some connections and I'm going to start with uh, actually a question of Kate's, which is how did this group, how did this thing ever happen? Because it intersects actually with what Catherine was just talking about in terms of probabilities. So just to clarify, in the 1980s, the futures panels were brought together, which described a series of possible futures, a range of possible futures. And that was the input to the markers panel that they were supposed to begin with and then come up with ways to address what the futures panel actually was about. And it was called the futures panel by the government. It was about assigning probabilities of intrusion under different future parameters to this group. So the futures panels are, there's, there's a longer history, of course, of people um, talking about how we can mark nuclear waste, talking especially about uh, the, from a linguistic anthropological perspective, from one linguistic anthropological perspective, how messages could be secured. Actually quite pessimistic if you read it carefully, the linguistic anthropologist who was, who was involved from the beginning to the end of this project essentially says the only message we can secure for the long term is we were here. Um, not even we were here and we did something bad, but just we were here. Um, and, uh, you know, a semiotic 
approach that ends with the, the proposal that the only way to secure this knowledge is to create a religion around nu the nuclear waste sites with a future Knights Templar, a secret society that will pass along the knowledge. So we begin with those kind of speculations about how to keep very um, detailed linguistic, linguistically coded information and portray it forward. And the specialists involved are quite dubious about that. Um, but the, the actual reason for having these panels at all is to come up with probabilities pre-computer probabilities. So you basically had sets of people deciding how likely different intrusions would be, which may be the most um, bizarre part of reading this is seeing these tables of numbers and realizing that we've come through the use of computers to take these kinds of tables of numbers as having meaning. When we know that the tables of numbers the computers produce are also based on the inputs. You know, the algorithm, the, the computer programming, it just allows you to weigh more different factors. The, the programming, if you will, that the futures and markers panels had was narrative, was scenarios. And that wasn't built into the project. The, the government uh, agency representatives who write about it say, you know, we didn't ask them to write fiction. But one of the key people involved that they recruited was a physicist who was also a science fiction author. And one of the key people involved was an illustrator of science fiction who also worked with Carl Sagan on how to send you know, those messages on satellites out into space. So you had at least two people who were active in the science fiction community. The idea of imagining futures the idea of, of futurism in this project is deeply tied to those folks. Um, and, and really the, the rationale, the exercise, the, the regulatory structure that justified it was the need to determine probabilities of intrusion, to have a numerical uh, way of saying what's most probable. And so we have the, 100 years in the future, the feminist potash collective having rejected uh, normative masculine science will ignore, they'll be able to see the warnings, but they'll ignore them because they were based on bad masculine science. And so in 100 years, in one scenario, or one probability or one run of the computer program, if you will, um, we have that way of releasing it, all the way to the longest term version, which uh, says that a fictional character, not, not unlike Smokey the Bear, um, will be invented that will allow children to be inculcated with the idea of uh, nuclear waste being dangerous and a museum will exist on the site. And that will that's the one scenario that the planners suggested would, would leave the site without intrusion. Not the Knights Templar, but a Mickey Mouse sort of uh, thing. So we definitely, this begins with probabilities and it begins with probabilities of human intrusion. Separately from that is the temporality of nuclear waste itself. And I think this goes as well to Kate's question about what, you know, why is it nuclear waste as opposed to all these other wastes? Mercury is a particular interest to me right now. The book that I'm working on about ancient Honduras, I'm looking at a series of materials that are quite important and um, cinnabar and mercury is part of that book. So we know that mercury has been being produced and it's highly dangerous for human organisms for a long time, um, but it, it isn't those ancient materials which are toxic that arouse this. And I think there's a way that nuclear waste is figured today in which it is a living being. And I wanna go back to bad science fiction. I teach a freshman seminar where, we, where I make students watch movies that are set in Central American archeological sites or that have archeologists as protagonists. And I, I designed the whole freshman seminar so I could justify showing people Cal Tiki, which is a movie about a monster in a cenote in Yucatan that is activated by passing meteors 
But there's also this radioactive thing. So they start in an archaeological site and they end up in Mexico City in labs because the material that this monster is made of is radioactive. 1950s era movie. What radioactive meat meant in the atomic culture of the 1950s was uncanny, was stuff that's supposed to be inert but's not inert. And here I would point to the anthropologist Elizabeth Povinelli and her work in geontologies where she draws attention to the uncanniness of the inert acting. Um, and I draw on Mel Chen's work on animacies. There are certain kinds of materials that the, um, the sort of Anglo-American and European consensus view of the, of the status of stuff says shouldn't be active. They should be subject to this kind of human control. And I think nuclear waste stands as the figure of the most active of those. Um, and, but it's active on a time scale that on the one hand, there are half-lives that are totally fleeting. And on the other hand, there are these very long time scales. Half-life itself, if you think of it, rather than thinking of it in terms of the temporality of years, but, but half-life itself as a temporality is a, is a strange way to think about things. We don't have half-lives. There's not a point where we're half dead. So there's, a, there's an aspect in which nuclear waste never dies. Nuclear things never die. The half-life um, means it's like the paradox. You're always halfway there. There's always still some activity. And that seems to completely uh, contrast with our understanding, this sort of humanist understanding of life is an absolute followed by an equally absolute death. And again, that that's not a tenable thing in um, you know, post-humanist or uh, anthropology beyond the human is very engaged with this kind of thing as well. So I don't think it's I don't think it's accidental that it's nuclear waste that's drawing this kind of uncanniness. Um, I, and that brings me to one of the little points that that I want to make certain people caught. Um, the ten thousand year time scale. When I first first started doing this project. I kept trying to find out where that 10,000 years came from. And my first folk approximation, my, my common sense, was that must be the half-life of something. So I spent a lot of time trying to find the half-life that it was. Like what element was 10,000 years coming from? And it took me the longest time to realize that 10,000 years had nothing to do with some half-life of some particular elements. That's not what it's about. It's a, it's a amount of time, as you said, that the Environmental Protection Agency decided was the appropriate amount of time for the risk for humans to come down to the right level. And then recently they've reformed that and it's now a million years, which of course makes the entire enterprise moot since there's no human signaling on a million year scale. The human signaling part, 10,000 years as well, um, as many of these planning documents say, that is beyond the persistence of any of these monuments. Now it's not beyond the existence of what I call trace materialities, which the technosphere is a really great way, I think, to mediate between um, the, the idea that the, some people use the Anthropocene now in this expanded notion to try and talk about the fact that humans and our human ancestors have actually transformed the globe for a very long time, leaving behind concentrations of materials in different ways than they would have been had there not been humans or human ancestors. But the, the other way to think about it is simply that um, the world is an accrual of the residues of all the beings that have ever been in it. And that includes all the humans and non-humans as well. And humans, continually engage with that world and with all of those accrued materialities, all that stuff. And from that perspective, the 10,000 years is again, still completely arbitrary since I can come up with phenomena that are about 10,000 years ago, that began about 10,000 years ago, but they're not part of any standard archeological way of thinking. In the course where we started this, my colleagues and I were working um, a, a specialist in the Paleolithic, a specialist in the Neolithic, and me working in the, um, the Americas 
where the beginning of village life is around 2000 to 1500 BC, which is very recent compared to Europe. And in those three different kinds of practices of archaeology, in the Paleolithic, you can talk about time scales of 10,000 years at a time. You can talk as if a site represents an, a human being for 10,000 years. And that's not considered weird, even though the actual site itself represents the living of people over perhaps two or three generations, which would be the more proper way to think about it. That contradiction doesn't go away when you get to my version, which is we get down to the point of 100 years. But the actual archaeological site isn't 100 years long. It's not even a palimpsest. We have all of these attempts to try and come up with a language of it. The actual archaeological site is a congealment of different kinds of durations of human action and, and non-human action, of materials that last a long time and materials that alter at different time uh, scales. And that, that kind of thinking is actually very difficult for us to do, right? This project just says 10,000 years is the thing. Stonehenge has lasted for 4,000 years, so we can beat it because we've got better control over granite. Um, all of these kinds of propositions about time are just offered in this matter of factness, which I think actually is an index of the anxiety that that really should, should create. If you actually try and think about it, all of those time frames are problematic. And you can see the same thing when they read the texts on certain monuments or certain objects, um, the Rosetta Stone or the Code of Hammurabi or the um, the cliffside at Behistun or Bisotun, each of which is read by the project participants as having a certain level of futurity, as being directed to a future. That's a, that's a rereading of texts that don't actually have that futurity in it. So when people say Hammurabi established the first law code, that's not what it is at all. But by saying that, we're saying that Hammurabi was looking towards a future and creating a future. But if there's a future in those texts, as I talk about, it's a very short-term future. It's me and my, my uh, family and my family's, uh, my children and my children's children. It's a, a genealogical time scale. And this whole project is sort of trying to wrench us out of a genealogical time scale. And for me, one of the things that I most regret having lost in the migration of the files is at one point I found a place in some part of the government document where one of the commentators, a government agency commenting on another government agency, says actually the longest this project will work is 700 more years. And that's based on the fact that no government has ever lasted more than a thousand years. And I read that and I was very startled, no system of government. And we've lasted about 300 years, so there'll be about 700 more years. Because there, I'm not quite certain what the thousand year government is. The only thousand year governments I can think of are a little, again, nauseating. But it becomes very clear that there's this set of sort of archetypes of temporalities involved. So um, I think because nuclear waste is, is figured as this lively, active thing, um, the the question of why this group of people, now why the specific group of people got together, there's stories about each of them. I, I wanna point out there's no artists except for the illustrator for science fiction. There's no real artists involved. There is a um, landscape architect who primarily in his day job designed offices, open plan offices, which there's something I can't quite do with that, figure out how to relate that to the fact that that's who's designing these, these monstrous sized installations. But I think there's something there. Um, the scales of temporality, the final thing, and I'm on my minute, will be just about this, the communication, that storytelling is the effective communication all of these people end up saying we should use rather than uh, the probabilistic thing. But the other way that communication happens and endures is actually through the thing that the technosphere, it's through the endurance of the stuff itself, the discard that is there. And this is, this is something that resonates with contemporary archeology span very well. We understand that what stabilizes human ways of being is the materiality that's 
that's created and that lasts beyond, beyond a single human lifespan. So in that sense, there is at the core of this, I think, a, a real understanding that I would say is archeologically solid. And- uh, There's a question from the audience um, and I think it's a good one. Um, uh, an, an anonymous <laughs> attendee at 114 asked, is there any concern that using a marker of any kind will make people more curious about what lies beneath? Um, in other words, even if danger is indicated, wouldn't it be human nature to want to uncover it no matter what? Um, uh, yes, and this is something I talk about actually at some length in the book. Um, the original planners also considered it in, in their scenarios of the future. They consider certain specific kinds of, of people who will be attracted to the site. Um, probably the most, uh, the most important to their planning exercise is future materials, uh, uh, construction mining kinds of things that people will come looking for. And that's why the Potash Collective is important. Even if this is put someplace that currently doesn't have a resource that we need in the future, people might like that resource and they might come and mine this and they might ignore these warnings or not be able to read them. Um, archaeologists are the other figure that are used by the planners as possibly people who will deliberately intrude in the future. We are actually seen as, I think, the model of people who would be curiosity driven. So either you'll be <clears throat> commercially driven or curiosity driven to go ahead and excavate. And in fact, one of the first presentations I made of this, I was having an exchange with somebody who thought I wasn't treating the project very seriously. And a philosopher who was present actually tried to solve the problem. And he said, well, they could build two of these, one big one and one smaller one the big one could be really on the site and the small one could be nearby. And he said, then the archeologists would only investigate, would investigate the smaller one. And I said, no, no, no. The archeologists would have to investigate both because they'd represent two different sizes of the same phenomenon and we'd have to investigate them to find out what they are. So the idea that a marker will keep people away in and of itself was not part of the final design. What we haven't talked about is that the final design actually calls for the surfaces, every exposed surface to be covered with linguistic messages saying, this is dangerous, don't dig here, including in multiple languages, including technologies that are proposed to try to ensure that even as the stone erodes, there might be another level of the message that will come out by burying across the site many, many small buried markers, each of them with a warning in, by making those warnings in multiple spoken languages, but also in ideographic messaging based again on a 20th century utopian vision of being able to use images to unambiguously convey messages. So think of a three panel cartoon that shows you digging, shows a gas coming up and shows you lying down with X's in your eyes as communicating for all time that if you dig here, you will die of radioactive gas. Um, that, uh, that covering all the surfaces with texts is the thing that actually secures this. And actually, if you read what the actual planning documents, but the final uh, version says, even that isn't considered to be the effective thing. The effective thing is gonna be that there'll be archives in the future that can serve the documents that the government produces and distributes around the globe telling us where these things are. So ultimately, the truth is that nobody involved in this enterprise thinks that this kind of an installation will actually work, which allows me to come back to Kate being called in 2001. The one thing I know happened in 2001 is they started doing the implementation design for WIP. The, and the implementation design sets aside almost all the archeology, span but it's very interested in the messages. So we have, I think, very little time left before our matrix host would like us to close. So I'd like to invite Kate to make any final comments that she might like. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, well, I look forward to um, your next work. <laughs> Mercury has certainly become part of, suddenly part of my field to be looking at. Um, 
yeah, I guess I was I was just thinking about who's going to show up at the at the at the at the site, and why isn't it going to be like your archetypal right. teenage uh, teenage lovers, or you know, right. uh, that happens in the movies. That's also the, the moment, <laughs> but showing up. What else was something about the writing and the communication? Well, no, let me. Well, so let me think about what I was thinking was the millennia time frame, which yeah. is quite amazing and why would we even want to think about humans that far yeah. down I mean that implies an incredible overvaluation of yes. human life in the future that I wish you know maybe we should have more of now with respect to climate change and, and 100 years in the future you know that that um you know I've come across that kind of attitude before but really only in the the, the craziest of Silicon Valley billionaires there's a there's a whole like group of them that want to think about uh, basically give human life a hundred thousand years hence the same value as human life today which is an argument why you shouldn't give to poor people because you've got to worry about preserving future people from artificial intelligence um this is something yeah. is a thing but so that was that was like wow million years let's 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 maybe think about different ways to use our limited resources <laughs> yeah. that, that was probably my closing thought with those questions yeah, the million year time scale when it is in is put in place can't actually change the planning exercise. It's not that anybody is saying there will be humans a million years. It what it does is it means all of the scenarios for intrusion suddenly become true. Mm -hmm. All right. Intrusion yeah. is inevitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just let it happen. <laughs> yeah, that's... Again, one of the more chilling things I can't relocate is somewhere in the documents that I originally recorded, um, someone saying the best marker will be the, the pile of skeletons from the dead bodies that accrue. Yeah. Wow. Which actually misunderstands how radioactivity works. Yeah. It's not that you would be struck by it there and like die. Um, but it's, uh, you know, unless you chose to live on the site, I suppose. all of those imaginations of future humans based on current humans and current humans in particular cultural contexts with particular structures of regulation. Yeah. And knowing again, like you've said, Rosemary, that what actually happens at WIP or what happens at Yucca Mountain is not constrained by the right. design process. Right. Something will happen, things will follow from there. Yeah. And then we will be left with the nuclear waste. And we haven't even talked about the fact that there's a kind of attempt to act as if the environment won't change. I'll leave that that. that. Well, um, I guess we're coming up on 1.30 and I, um, I, I guess the, the conversation is kind of coming to a close. So I wanted to take an opportunity to thank you. I think this has been an amazingly fruitful and evocative discussion of um, entangled time scales and deep futurity and the endurance of nuclear materiality from a number of perspectives. And it also occurred to me that I didn't thank you in the beginning for rescheduling this. This is, uh, this is of course, something that we had intended, a conversation we'd hoped to had, have um, back last spring when campus closed and you've all been um, wonderful uh, and accommodating and rescheduling it. And we're just delighted that it came um, came to fruition at last. So um, with that, I, I thank all of our um, Rosemary and Catherine and Kate, uh, you're all amazing. And um, thank you for the wonderful conversation. And I wanna thank the audience members who were able to come and, um, and to those of you who might turn in in the future. And just to remind you to subscribe to Matrix's newsletter and follow us on Twitter and uh, keep an eye out for more sessions of Authors Meets Critic in the future. So with that, I wish you a good day and fortitude uh, waiting for the election results. <laughs>